I'd like to tell you a little story before we get started. I heard this as a testimony of a missionary I heard at a church I used to go to down in Florida. Uh, the missionary was actually a doctor who had left his medical practice after being called to the mission field and wanted to serve the Lord with his life. He went down into Africa and uh, the little place where he was, he was trying to reach out to the surrounding villages and the way he would do it is he would, uh, he would um, go and uh, the people who were in those little villages were very poor. Uh, whenever they were sick, whenever there were injuries, whenever things go on, they didn't have anyone that could really give them medical care, nor could they afford it. So he would go in to be able to give medical care and at that same time be able to share the gospel with them. Well, the particular village where he was going this time was roughly a two-day journey. There was no access to it by car, uh, definitely not from where he was without going all around through this big roundabout route. And so the easiest and best way for him to be able to make the trip was to be able to uh, forage on through the jungle. And he, um, it was a, about a two-day walk. He'd have to um, bed down for the night somewhere along the way in the jungle and then get to the village the following day. He'd spend the whole day in that village caring for people, helping them, sharing the gospel before making the two-day trip back to where he, where he was located from over there. And so he would do this about once a month. So he came into the village and uh, there was a, a little boy who, I, I don't remember the story, if he was sick, if he was injured, but the, the missionary stopped and helped him and then went on and helping other people, you know, trying to give them medicine and be a good testimony of the Lord, finished up made his two-day trip back to where he came from and uh, you know continued on as things have been all his other trips well his next return trip to the village about a month later he ran across that same little boy and th they began talking and he led him to the Lord and that little boy became a help when he would visit that village and he would help get people and help bring them to to the missionary so he could give them medical care and be able to uh, witness to them and stuff well after several months had passed he started talking to the little boy I'm just curious on what was it that led him to want to come to get saved to know the Lord and the boy was and now I say little boy he wasn't that little he's probably an early teenager early teenage years and the boy was a little scared to talk to him about it but he finally opened up and he said well you're gonna be ashamed of me when I give the testimony and that's why I never wanted to tell you but the missionary was really curious now and so he kind of prodded and pushed and then the boy opened up and how the testimony went was after he had gotten medical care that day while he was sitting there he saw the 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 doctor bag that the missionary had saw the stuff that was in it and realized this is worth a lot of money and he was sitting there thinking about his family's poor and you know, they could use this money, they could take that medicine, they could sell that medicine to get money to be able to buy food. A lot of the people were starving, they certainly were very, uh, not very well off. And so the boy went and he got some friends, told them about it, and they made a plan that they were going to follow the missionary into the jungle that night. And when he bed down for his evening, when he made it about halfway or so, they were all going to kill him while he slept, take his bag, take the medicine, so that they would be able to sell that. And that, that's exactly what they set out to do. So they tracked him. They stayed far enough behind that he didn't realize they were following him. They knew where he was on up ahead. They saw him getting ready to get his camp set for the evening. And then they sat and they waited. And how, the test, how he told the testimony was that after they had waited and they knew that he was asleep, they all, and there was about four or five of them, they all came out and they, they went to kill him. But to their surprise, he was encircled. And I forget the exact number. It was either uh, 17 or 27. But just for the, for the sake of the illustration and to um, err on the side of conservatism, um, we'll just say it was 17 was the number. There were 17 armed soldiers holding rifles at an attention stance standing in a circle all around the missionary in every direction facing away from him in a circle all the way around him and those boys now they were very scared for their lives that they would even make it out of their alive and so they they tried very quickly to get away from there as fast as possible and and back 
<laughs> the way that they came from so that nothing happened to them. And the boy said to the missionary that he didn't know much about whatever this God was that he was talking about. But anyone who had that kind of power and influence with, uh, with military and political leaders, that, that they were there to watch him while he slept. That was a man that he wanted to get to know and then ended up getting saved as a result of it. And the missionary said, well, I can assure you there was nobody there but me that night. And the boy said, look, as you know, pretty much as God is my witness, and those men were, those soldiers were there. They were standing around you. They were protecting you. And so, as the missionary was telling this story, and he, and he's back. He's he was he came back to the United States. He's going around, um, you know, visiting the churches that support him. And this was his home church that he was visiting, and he was sharing this testimony. And then one of the men raised their hands out in the congregation, asked if they could ask a question. He's like, "Yes, yeah, sir. You know, go ahead." And he asked about if he knew how long ago this was and the man thought he's like well i guess it's probably about four or five months ago and then the other man said well there was a time he said probably about four or five months ago he said i was at home with my family and out of nowhere i felt the unbelievable urge that i needed to pray for you that your life was in mortal danger and that you needed help and and it was something that i i, I didn't even you know i would try to pray at home didn't even try to do that he said i went and i called some men and i said this missionary there's something wrong we need to pray and he says so a group of us all got together and we came over to the church that night and we started praying for you for your safety and, and that god would protect you and the missionary now and as the boy said that there were 17 soldiers lined all around him there in that circle the missionary said by any chance are the other men who were with you that night, are they here tonight in the congregation? And the man looked around and he said, yes, all of them are here. And so he just said, could I just ask if everyone could for a moment stand up if you came to the church that night to pray for me? And 17 men stood up. The power of prayer. There was, as we said in the first part of the service, there was a need an unbelievable need, a need that could only be satisfied by a miracle. A need that this man wasn't even aware was needed. He would have been dead that night. But God placed the heart on the hearts of these men the need to pray, and they came to pray. They came to they came as we we talked about the points this morning. They got out of their comfort zones. They left their homes. They came to the church. They came unto God, they came seriously and fervently with one desire, that was to pray for this man's safety, and 17 men sat in that church over here in America praying for that missionary, and God sent 17 angels who that boy saw and perceived as armed soldiers. But 17 angels encamping around that missionary that night, one for every single man who came to pray. We were talking about the power of prayer. And uh, it, it's, it's one thing for me to tell this story. It was another thing to hear it in person. It just even remembering how it was when I first heard this testimony all these years ago has little tinglys going all up and down my spine just thinking about how, how po the, the power of prayer and how powerful God is. Something that we really don't see in the world today. The miracles and, and the power that, that God has as, as was displayed in the early New Testament church and, and back in the Old Testament. And, and we were talking about about the power of prayer and reasons why sometimes we don't God does not answer our prayers just very very quickly to recap we talked about uh, right out of um, Acts chapter 12 and we talked about how Peter was miraculously delivered out of prison and out of the hand of Herod when he would have killed him the next day and, and we focus primarily on Acts chapter 12 and verse 5 where it said that prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him, for Peter. And we talked about those as four points. Four points. And we just mentioned them praying seriously and earnestly, continuously, without ceasing, specifically, 
specifically for Peter in that instance, and, and coming unto God, getting out of our comfort zone, and, and bringing ourselves unto God, where we're praying unto God rather than at God. Those of you online listening who didn't have a chance to join us for the first part of the service, the power of prayer, I would uh, really like to ask if you would just go and you can take a look at that online and see us on YouTube and take a look at that service. I definitely believe it will be a blessing for you in your life. But I said at the conclusion of that service as we closed that, wait a minute, even though we have this big God with all this power and can do all these miraculous things and can come down and help you in your impossible situation, that, wait a minute, sometimes there are things in our lives that we do that hinder prayer. Things that we do that hinder prayer. Someone could say, okay, Brother Spencer, I've come unto God, and I've and I prayed, and I'm seriously, seriously and earnestly praying, and I'm begging Him for these things. I'm on my knees crying out to God for the specific request I have. And I pray, and I pray, and I pray, and I pray. What if nothing happens? What if God doesn't do anything? I think all of us, if we have been a Christian for any length of time, can seriously say that at one point in time in life, we have done this, and that has been the result. That nothing happened. And then someone could say, well, how, you know, I, I don't understand. You know, you know, how, how do we pray and that nothing happens? Well, that is a possibility. Because aside from understanding how to pray, the Bible does say that there are roadblocks that we have in our lives that keep our prayers from being answered. You, um, those, those of you ladies listening, maybe you have a flower garden. Some at Colin likes gardening, so maybe some of you men, if you have a flower garden, and you got your hose, and you got the water turned on, and you're just out, and you're watering your, you're watering your crops in your garden. You're like sitting there watching, and the, it's a hot summer day, and the, the plants are all thirsty, and they're really enjoying that water getting sucked up by that hose. Or, or maybe you're out washing your car, and you're going around, and you're making your car look all shiny and everything, and then all of a sudden, you notice something strange has happened you look down at your hose and there's no more water coming out there's nothing going on and so we we are intelligent people and as intelligent people we do the very first thing that all intelligent people do we go and we check the water spigot to see if the water's turned on don't we that's the first thing. Yeah, it is. That's the first thing we do. We go and check the water spigot, and then we sit there and think, oh, maybe someone, I don't know why we would think that, that someone came and turned it off on us, but we think that. And then we get out there and we go and check the water. So, huh, the, the, the water spigot's on. It's on full. You look back at the hose. It's like, there's no pressure. There's no power behind this water. And we as adults, we know very quickly what has happened. But imagine if you're a little child and you're out there playing with a hose and it's the very, very first time that's happened. You have, you have come across that great principle that all of us know have, that great thing in life to help you in many, many life lessons called the kink in the hose. The kink in the hose. I am going to relate prayer to you tonight in terms of a kink and a hose. Something, I mean, the, the everything is on to be able to make it flow, make the water flow, have the power there. But there is something that has happened that has kinked or blocked or made it so that that water pressure is not coming out. I'm also going to relate to you, in addition to being kinks and a hose, the problems with prayer as a roadblock. There are some things, some kinks and hoses, some roadblocks in our prayer life that hinder and uh, simply uh, prevent God from answering our prayers, no matter how fervently, no matter how continuously, no matter how specifically we pray some roadblocks to answered prayer. I'm going to define roadblock as anything known or unknown that hinders our prayers from being answered. A roadblock is anything that is known or unknown that hinders our prayers from being answered. It doesn't always have to be something big either. 
It could be just a little thing, something just a little bit out of place in our lives, but it could be something very big that we have to make some major life changes. But uh, as we get into the service, and I'm sitting here looking at our time, and I already I spent a little bit too much time on my very first illustration, so I'm afraid we're going to have to go a little bit quickly through the rest of the service, unfortunately. There are six specific, if I can count, six specific roadblocks that I am going to consider as things that hinder our prayers from being answered. Despite when we talked about in our first service about coming unto God rather than praying at God, but coming unto God, falling on our knees, getting our, our hearts right, praying specifically to God, asking Him for this certain thing, begging God, crying out to God with the fervent and, and, and without ceasing and all of that. But we can do all of that. And if we have one of these roadblocks, then none of that even really matters. Roadblock number one, you're going to find in James chapter four, verse two. We're going to be looking through a lot of scripture today. So if you have your Bibles, you can either turn to them if you like. You don't have to. I will read them for you just, to, just for sake of time. James chapter four, verse two. Very simply, ye have not because ye ask not. You, you do not have because you do not ask. Sounds kind of simple, doesn't it? You know, sometimes we just don't get our prayers answered because we don't ask in prayer. For, for a way of how I try to relate it to some of you people. Let's say that, you know, there's a financial crisis, some need that you have in your family or, or something, and there's a buddy who says, you know what, there's a financial need. I can give you some money to help out with this. And, and, and you as a, as, a, as a working man or a working lady might say, well, you know, I don't, I don't want to take that, um, you know, I, I don't like borrowing money from people and he's like don't worry about paying it back it's a gift i just want to help you out and you say no 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 no. we don't need that you know we'll be able to get by we'll be able to make it and he's thinking i might be able to work more hours at work or pick up another job something else that i can do to be able to get that money and he simply does not get it because he does not ask we we don't get it because we don't ask and for whatever reason usually our pride that would keep us from asking but you know what? Sometimes you just don't get it because you don't ask. Pretty simple, isn't it? Roadblock number one, you have not because you ask not. Well, the next one, that was quick, roadblock number two. This one we're going to take a little bit more time on. It's found in the very next verse, James chapter 4, verse 3. It says, Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lusts. Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lusts. That word amiss means out of the proper course or order, improperly, wrongly, or astray. It basically means for the wrong reason. You ask, but you don't receive, because you ask for something that is wrong, or for the wrong reason, and why, it says that ye may consume it on, upon your lusts. That's basically Old English speaking for, uh, that you may use it up to get something for your own fleshly desires. You're asking for stuff for your own fleshly desires. Let me give you an example you might be able to relate to. Garth Brooks had a song called, I Thank God for Unanswered Prayers. It's been a long time since I've listened to that song. No, I didn't go and listen to it before this service. So uh, any of you who know that song and I get it a little bit wrong, I apologize. Don't correct me and say, well, that's not how it was supposed to be. Basically, the gist of the song, as I remember, is that um, you know he had, maybe it was uh, like a high school reunion or some get together, but he ran across a woman who back when he was a younger man, he was very much in love with. And, you know, back when he was a younger man, he would not, have, he would have done anything for this girl. He wanted this girl. He was in love with that girl. And through some way or another, it didn't work out. And, and as he goes through the song, talking about all those feelings and stuff for he had for this girl that, you know, it, they're much later in life now, he ends up getting back home to his family and he sees his wife and he sees his kids and he realizes how God has blessed him for, for where he is now. Now, realizing that he never would have been with his wife had he gotten that other girl like he prayed for, realizing his kids never would have been here had he been able to be with that girl. And he says, I thank God for unanswered prayers. I thank God for unanswered prayers. I could really go off on a rabbit trail with this one, talking about relationships to the people that all of you have that are either in the will or out of the will of God. And, and 
There are different ways that you can relate, and I bet many, many of you can, can relate to this exact thing. I know I can relate to that. There were times I was in love back before I met my wife when that relationship ended for one reason or another, and I went to God and begged and begged and pleaded and pleaded and pleaded for some way to, to make that relationship work. But I'm looking at a bunch of children here today that would never have been here, never even existed, had that relationship worked out, had God answered that prayer and sometimes we don't get what we want because it's not in the will of God you can fully employ all of these prayer principles that we have already discussed but if your request is outside the will of God he's not going to answer your prayer He's not going to answer your prayer roadblock two is we ask but we don't get it because we ask for the wrong reasons that it may satisfy our own humanly, our own fleshly desires, and not because it is the will of God for our lives. I mean, I've even some, seen some people who pray for things that seem like it would be totally in the will of God, but they pray for the wrong reasons, and then they don't get it. They pray selfishly. So when you're praying today, the, the things that you are praying about, the things that you are thinking about, I just want you to think about how you pray. What is it that you're praying for, and why are are you praying for it? I mean, even if your prayer is for something such as, please help my husband be able to get stronger and closer with the Lord so he can serve the Lord better. Or please help my wife to get saved. Or you know, please be with my children and help them to be able to live right. Or if they're getting out of the way, please help them to bring that way. Why are you praying it? I mean, you know, these are good. These could be good things. Help us get a job, better job so we can have a little bit more money and thinking we can also give more money to the church or whatever. But, you know, these might be good things to pray for. But why are you praying it? What is the motive behind your prayer? One of the reasons why prosperity gospel is so against the will of God, I think you know, I got on my YouTube little thing. I, I do not subscribe to his channel. I don't know why it even pops up, but I get stuff popping up all the time for Joel Olstein. It's just a little notification. I'm like, why am I getting this? I don't follow Joel Olstein. I don't agree with anything that Joel Olstein says. He's a prosperity gospel uh, teacher. You know, and, and other people like Peter Popov and him and, and others basically bless me, Lord, and give me wealth and give me influence. And he's like, oh, God will heal you, and God, He wants you to succeed. He'll give you that money. He will give you that. God just wants you to be prosperous and wants to do all these things for you. And people. People soak this up like a sponge because people want stuff. We're selfish. Bless me, give me wealth, give me influence. You know, you can send your ties off to these guys, and your money might very well make them prosperous, but I doubt you're going to receive a blessing out of it. John chapter 14, verse 14 is a big prosperity gospel verse. It says, if you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. That sounds like a promise from God that go ahead and ask for it and he's going to give it to you right doesn't that sound like that so we say lord please give me this new job so we can make more money so we can get a bigger better house and and a better television so we can get a new car in jesus name amen See, we put those magic words on it, in Jesus' name, amen, and then it's automatically going to happen, right? That's what we always do whenever we want something. We pray for this selfish, 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 in Jesus' name, and then it's going to happen. I mean, that, that's what we do. It's where we get the whole name it and claim it. I name it. Oh, I want that in Jesus' name, and it's yours. But there's a preceding verse to that passage, John 14, 13. It says, And whatsoever you shall ask in my name, keywords, in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Did you see that? In my name are not three little magic words that you can tack onto something and get whatever you want. They mean for the glory of, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You go over to England and someone makes an arrest of someone and they basically, you know, you know a diplomat might come to meet you and they will say, well, I'm here in the name of the Queen. 
because she's the ruler of that country. And so they are there, and their purpose of there is for the glory of their sovereign. They are there for the glory of the queen. So just by saying, in the name of the queen, give me that, that's not going to do squat. But they're saying, I'm here on behalf of the queen, in the name of the queen, for the glory of the queen. So we put that, it, in my name, just means that it's to represent them, for them, for their glory. It doesn't mean tack in Jesus' name onto something and get it. They're not magic words. It means for the glory of. If you ever want to understand what a passage means when it says in my name or in the name of, try substituting the words for my glory or for the glory of in place of the words in my name. See if that verse changes perspective a little bit. Let's try it. John chapter 14 verse 13. This is Jesus speaking. He says, and whatsoever ye shall ask for my glory, that will I do that God the Father might receive glory in His Son. It looks a little bit different, doesn't it? It makes a little bit of a difference. Jesus' motivation for praying was not self-fulfillment, a better self-image, a happier life, a bigger home, a nicer business, and a better connected family. Jesus' motivation for prayer, now, and by the way, if God chooses to bless you with one of those things, then amen, hallelujah. But that's not God's primary will or design for your life. Jesus' motivation in praying was the glory of God. The definition of glory means great honor, praise, or renown. Jesus' motivation in prayer was that when, when prayers were answered, that the answering of that prayer would make people glorify the Lord or bring them to Him so that they could get saved. And when we do things today and we pray, what we pray for should be something that so whatever the result of what we're praying for is going to be able to witness to other people, to win them to Christ. They're going to see that miracle. And it's going to draw them to Jesus Christ because of that. God is going to receive glory. It's going to lift up the Lord. And people are going to praise God because of that miracle. So when you pray... Do you pray so that God receives that glory so that these things and the, the things that you want to happen are for the glory of God or the purpose of your prayer so that you may receive something? Jesus said that your life and your prayers should be that when you are praying, uh, what you're praying for will not be so that people have a wonder. They will not see what a wonderful person that you are. And how great you are because you have been blessed by these things. You're going to, they're going to see how great God is. And they will be able to see God's power and His love and His mercy and His forgiveness and His grace. And that your prayers will lead people to Christ. And if that's your motive, then you're praying right. But if that's not your motive, and you're praying for even something that sounds like it's biblical, but if you're praying for selfish reasons then you've got a kink in your hose. Exodus chapter 32 is a great example of this. And if you've seen that movie, The Ten Commandments, I refer to that a lot because I like the movie so much. You're watching that movie, The Ten Commandments, at the end, you know, Moses is getting the Ten Commandments. He's been up in that mountain for a while. And God, after he gives it to him, he says, get down because the people have corrupted themselves. And Moses gets down there and there is a huge party going on. I mean, they have constructed a golden calf that they're worshiping. They're making sacrifices to it. They're, they're running around. The, the Bible Bible says that they're out there doing fornication and lasciviousness, taking their clothes off, nudity, you know, drinking and drunkenness and all of that in the worship of this cat. By the way, you see how the, the nice parallel that the things when people worship strange gods, how much it reflects stuff that you could you know, go out to a bar today and you're drunk and you're partying and you're running around and making a fool of yourself and then you're sleeping with women and people are taking their clothes off and all kinds of stuff. You know, basically that is like worship, isn't it? It's like worshiping the devil, if you think about it. Because when you worship God, you're doing praises and singing to God and all those things that bring honor to God. Well, all of that stuff that they were doing for that golden calf, that's the same stuff that you do in your own sinful lives. Think about the next time you get ready to go out to a bar with your friends. You're basically getting ready to go worship the devil. Because you're doing everything that God doesn't want you to do. Who's getting glory from that? Satan. Think about that. This isn't a passage on that or a, or a message on that. Just think about that. 
we see here back in, in, in uh, the, the story of that, the, what happened there in the Ten Commandments. We find that in the book of Exodus chapter 32. Here's Moses. He comes down. He sees all of this stuff going on. And he goes back and he and basically says, yeah, Lord, you, you were right. This is what they were doing down there. Verses 9 and 10, God makes the decision that he's done with them already. He just brought them out of Egypt. They just got the Ten Commandments. God makes the decision in verses 9 and 10. He says, I'm going to kill them all. And then he says, I'm just, Moses, you're the only one that's even worth anything. I'm going to kill all of them. Forget it. I'm done with it already. And I'm going to make a great nation out of you. And then you read on in verses 11 through 13, you find out what Moses says. And Moses is begging God not to do it. And then these are the things he says. He said, Lord, think about your name. Think about your reputation. I mean, what are the Egyptians going to say when you brought them out of Egypt with all that power and then just killed them in the wilderness? I mean, what kind of what are they going to think of you, God? Think about your name and think about your reputation. And then as we read on, you see here that, that God decides in verse 14, he changes his mind according to what Moses has talked to him about, what Moses is praying. And, and Moses' motives entirely were... The glory of God. What are they going to think about you, God? You know, lifting up the Lord. It's an excellent, uh, an excellent example of praying unselfishly, concerned about the, go the glory of God and about God's reputation. What do you think about when you pray? Roadblock number three, moving on. This is the one that you knew was coming. Is sin in the life of or in the heart of the individual. Sin in the heart or in the life. Isaiah chapter 59 verse 1 says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear. Basically, he's saying that if the Lord's not saving you, it's not because it's not because he doesn't have enough power. It says it's, it hand is not shortened that it cannot save. Picture if you were some person drowning and I'm on that dock reaching down and my hand is just not long enough to reach down to him. He's saying that's not the problem. His hand is plenty long enough to be able to reach down to save to pull you out of that. And, and he, it is not because he doesn't have enough power. Neither is it because he can't hear. It says his ear is not too heavy that he cannot hear. It's not, it's not because he's deaf. It's not because he has a hearing problem that he's, he's not hearing your prayers. He says here in the next verse, he says, The reason why your prayers aren't answered, verse 2 is, But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. The Word of God reveals to us that it is because of your iniquity or your sin that a separation is between you and God and your sins have made it so He hides His face from you and He will not hear. He will not hear. And as we talk about this, talking about the sins, you know, it's not something like these little ups and downs that all of us experience. We already mentioned that. It's talking about basically unconfessed sin where you know that something is wrong in your heart and in your life. And basically you say, a, what, say something like, you know what, God, tough. You say, I'm not changing this for you, God. This is where God shows you that you're selfish. Or that there's a bad attitude you've had toward another person or an unforgiving spirit, or a moral issue in your life, or a sexual addiction, or an immoral relationship, such as you're a member of the LGBTQ community, or if you're living together with your boyfriend or girlfriend like you're married, but you're not really married. And you say to God, you have these things, these things going on. It's like, you know what, God, this is who I am. I'm not changing for you yeah, just accept me the way I am. And that's basically what you do. I mean, come on, that's what you do, isn't it? That's what we do. In fact, the principle here is found in Isaiah and in Psalm, sorry, not Isaiah, Psalm chapter 66, verse 18. He says, and this is talking about a person, and you talking to me, says, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not what? Finish it. Hear me. Hear me. 
If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. If I have sin in my heart and in my life, the Lord will not hear me. One may ask, why? Why won't God hear my prayers? You know, God's primary goal for your life as we walk around on this planet is not to make you happy, not to make you successful, not so you can have a better connected family, and not to boost your self-esteem. God's primary goal to see you for your life is to see you transformed or changed into a life that's living like Jesus Christ or for Jesus Christ, His Son. That's it. Period. That's His goal and what He wants for your life. And as a byproduct of that relationship with Him, there will be emotional security. There will be hope for the future, blessings in your life, and joy unspeakable. And you will get those things. But His number one plan, the will for your life, is to see you living your life as Jesus Christ lived it. A life that's loving and pure and compassionate and holy and honest. A man or woman of integrity. And when you're not doing that, He's not going to hear your prayers. He's not going to hear your prayers. I'll give you a quick illustration of a woman I used to work to uh, work with. I'm going to change her name because I do know her, or at least I, she has at one point in time seen some of the things I have put out here, so I don't want to call her name out on it. We're going to call her Patty. It certainly was not her name. Patty was uh, was at work with me, and we were talking one day, and Patty, you know, a professing Christian, and she's talking about all the stuff going wrong in her life, how she doesn't have money, her finances are bad, her relationship with her kids is wrong, and, and, and she prays and prays and prays and prays, and God just doesn't answer her prayers. He just, God will not hear. And so I start talking a little bit with, with Patty and just, you know, I, I'm thinking lots of different things. I start just start talking to her a little about how prayer and stuff like that. Well, you come to find out that Patty is married, but she separated for her husband about 20 years ago or so. It's been a while. She's still married to him. She then moved in with another man who she has had several children with while married to somebody else. At least a boy and a girl. There might have even been a third. I'm not quite sure. I don't remember. Then after having kids and living with that man for many years, she left that man and moved in with another man who now she is separated with and now living on her own. And, you know, physical, intimate relationships with all of these people and you know and, and she just sits here and you know she talks about how her kids can't connect with her and all of these things and she can't find a man who loves me you know and, and just i mean just thinking all of these things off the top i've got you know surely i didn't speak my mind to her but there's a lot of stuff going on in her life i mean she's been living in open sin for years upon years upon years. And she went to a church down south somewhere. And they were open and accepting of her relationship with her and her ex-boyfriend, not her husband. And they allowed that to go on. And allowed her to be a member of that church. And she would talk about what a great church it was. A very liberal church is what it was. Now, so, so let's just give some common sense here. Parents, those of you who are parents... When your kids are living in open defiance to the things that you want for your life, do you have an overabundant need to just give them what they want? I mean, if you're having bitter arguments with your son, you know, arguments and fights and fights and disrespect and stuff in the home, and he's like, Dad, I want the keys to go out with my friends Friday night. I don't know about you out there listening, but I tell you what, I'm not too eager to just say, here, son, and grab the keys, have a good time. That's not going to happen at all in my home. And, and we might say, well, you know, I'm not going to do that, but we go and live a life that's completely the opposite of the way that God wants us to live it, and we expect that we're going to get a different outcome. You know, and, and, and we, we will say things like something like, I know this relationship that I'm in is wrong according to your word, God, but I don't care. I'm going to do what I want to do. 
I'm not going to read your word. I'm not going to do what it says. I'm not going to turn from my sin. I'm not going to give up that relationship that you say is wrong according to your word. I'm not going to do that. And so we see we have, we have an issue in our life that's unresolved, sin in your life that's unconfessed or that you haven't repented of, and you pray, God's not going to answer. Because if you think about it, if He did and He were to give you what you want anyway, despite how you live your life, it would only encourage further disobedience. Parents, if your kids are rebelling and you give them what they want, that's not going to encourage them to do what you want. That's just going to encourage them to keep on rebelling. Psychological term. You ever hear this positive reinforcement of negative behavior? They tell that when you're raising your kids. All right, when your kids are doing something bad and then you give them love and compassion for it instead of discipline, okay, you are encouraging that bad behavior. They are going to keep Keep on doing it because they're getting what they want. That It could be attention. It could be whatever. But if you give positive reinforcement of negative behavior, it encourages continued disobedience. That's why we have other principles called tough love. I'm not going to give you what you want. You said what? Forget it. Now, I love my children and I would like to give things for my children. But when my children are rebelling against how I taught them, I'm not going to do it. And you know what, friend? When you're rebelling against God's word, he's not going to do it either. He's not going to give you the answers to your prayers. He knows that if he did, it would basically just continue living on the path that you're on. And what needs to happen, rather than you get the answer to your prayers, your will needs to break. And ladies and gentlemen, when you're living in sin... God is not going to give you what you want. And you know something else, folks, before I go on to the next point? I've found that prayer really is a double-edged sword. I mean, I can get everyone together and say, hey, everyone, we're going to have prayer tonight. Let's all get together and pray. We're going to pray for the kids who aren't living for God and these people to get healed and this stuff going on. Let's pray for our country. We're doing our revival series on, on uh, you know, Operation Heal America. Let's pray for our country. Let's pray for our leaders that they'll either get them out of office or or get good ones in, or they'll turn and repent of their sins and get saved. So they'll start make, stop making bad decisions, and we pray for our country and so that we won't get persecuted. We pray for all those things, and all that sounds good. And we're like, yeah, that's together. Let's pray. And then you start to pray. You get in that group, and everyone starts praying, and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit starts dealing with your life, and He starts showing you some things like problems with your attitude and pride. Words that you shouldn't ought to have come out of your mouth. The tone of voice that you use to speak to your kids, mom and dad. How you talk to your children. And the insensitivity that you have for your spouse as a husband and wife. And God starts to show you all kinds of things in your life that aren't right. And you know what? You don't like it. You don't want to hear that. You don't want to hear how you're doing wrong. You don't like that. Things that you have to give up and you see... This sermon that I'm preaching to you today might be very well one of the most important messages in terms of a long-term impact in your prayer life that you will ever hear. Because if you decide that you want to see God's power, if you decide you want to experience His supernatural impact, you want to see Him do something major in your life, and you get honest before Him, He may say to you, Scott, Samantha, Colin, Scarlett, D'Artagnan, are you out there listening, or any one of you? He might say to you, there's reasons why there's no power in your prayer life. You're not doing some things that I want you to do. And there's a kink in your hose. And if you want to experience power in your prayer life and you're not sure, here's something. You're not sure. I was doing this the other day. I went and I was like, man, I haven't sinned in a little while. I'm feeling pretty good. I'm praying to God. So I started thinking about this. And, you know, I'll just go ahead. So um, this is what David did in Psalm chapter 139, verses 23 and 24. He says, search me, O God, and know my heart. 
Try me and know my thoughts. He says, search my heart and test my thoughts, God. What am I thinking about? What are the thoughts that go through my mind? The things I think about. And see if there be any wicked way in me. And then he says, lead me in the way of everlasting. All right, so you just sit there and I started thinking maybe I should pray for God to show me sin in my life so I confess it. And you know what? I didn't want to. My wife's sitting here saying no. She doesn't want to. All right, maybe you're the same way. Sit down, yeah. It, it can be a scary thing. Pray that God will show you what's wrong in your life. But you know what? When you do that, it's confession. It's repenting of any sin in your heart or in your life so that the kink can come out of your hose. Get that kink out of your hose so that your prayers can be heard. Roadblock number four is an unforgiving spirit. I'll try to go quickly with the last ones. We all know Mark eleven twenty four says, Therefore I say unto you, What things soever ye desire when ye pray, believe that ye will receive them, and ye shall have them. But many of us forget verse 25 comes right after 24. Verse 25 says, And when ye stand praying, forgive. If ye have aught against any, that your Father also which is in heaven may forgive your trespasses. He says when you come to pray, you get on your knees to pray. If you have ill will or an argument or something against anybody at all anywhere, he says, forgive them. Forgive them. Notice why he says that your Father in heaven may forgive your trespasses, your sins. Verse 26, but if ye do not forgive... Neither will your Father, which is in heaven, forgive your sins. And all of this was saying right after talking about um, whatsoever you desire, when you pray, believe you will receive them, and you shall have them. And then all of this prerequisite that comes after it. An unforgiving spirit makes it impossible for God to hear our prayers. How can we, as God's children, who have been granted mercy and forgiveness by God... Now listen, everybody. Listen online. I'm talking about that teeth clenched, anger, fist double up. I mean, you want that person to pay. This is where you say, okay, God, I'm going to walk with you. I'm going to do, do this for you. But I'm not talking with that guy. I'm not going to look at that guy. I'm not going to see that guy. Anyone else is okay, but not that guy. I'm not going to let that grudge go. I'm not looking at him, I'm not talking to him, and when something bad happens to him, deep down I secretly rejoice. An unforgiving spirit. The Lord Jesus says to you, I forgave you, and you didn't deserve it. My command to you is that you release and forgive others. We talked about this back on our family services. I talked about the number one enemy of love being unresolved anger. And the next verse after that was dealing with unresolved anger. Those of you listening online, if you have a problem with this unforgiving spirit, I really suggest you check out those services on YouTube and watch them. And, and, and principles on how to deal with it and release that person. But you have something, an unforgiving spirit, you have got to release them from your judgment and from your revenge. Forgiving one another. Repeat that for me forgiving one another. Forgive them so that God can forgive you and get the kink out of your hose. Roadblock number five is the wrong treatment of our mate. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1-6. through six. Uh, This is, it basically has some, some principles on how God expects the wife to be in subjection to their husbands. Verse 1 teaches us that if any are married to a man who is lost that he may be able to be won to the Lord through the good, godly testimony of his Christian wife. So if she is doing all of these principles that is teaching her, and her husband is lost, she can very well have a chance to win him to the Lord. Verses 2 through 6 tell us of how the wife should conduct herself. I'm not going to hit on those. Go read them. Um, but uh, notice verse 7. Likewise, ye husbands, talking to the men, it says, Dwell with them, that's the wives, according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto that weaker or delicate vessel, and as a being heirs together of the grace of life. Notice this. Why? So that your prayers be not hindered. Unity and a godly loving relationship between a husband and a wife is a prerequisite for God hearing your prayers and showing his power 
in your life. And gentlemen, when you have a harsh or, or you're harsh or insensitive to your wife, or ladies, when there's a lack of submission and respect to your husbands as the spiritual leader in your home. Now, this is not a sermon on godly relationships and marriage. I Trust me, I could go off a long time preaching about this, but we'll never be here and never be able to get through this if I do. But, you know, we go out and, you know, we have a message on our, on our website called Roll Call, dealing of the role of the husband and the wife in the home. And check out our entire family series. We have a whole playlist on YouTube. Go through that and check the whole thing out. But you can see how how your relationships are with each other and what you're doing in in your relationships and your family are creating roadblocks between you and God and it hinders your prayers again one could ask why why God is it important that I have a godly you know a, a good loving relationship with my husband or wife in order for you to hear my prayer uh, you know why would this cause there to be a roadblock well that's simply because God is more concerned about your life and your relationships as a husband and a wife and that this kind of relationship is something that models the love of Jesus Christ he is more concerned about that than he is about you getting what you want he is more concerned about you living for Jesus Christ than you getting what you want just as he was more concerned that you repent of your sins and live holy lives than he was about you getting your way and getting what you asked for he says, and, you ask, and, and, and those of you who have this, you sit around and you ask and you ask and you ask and you ask and you pray and you pray and you pray and you're not getting it. I, I would think that some of you might be something kind of like me and maybe a little bit smart and say, you know what? Huh. Maybe the problem's with me. Maybe the problem's not with God. Maybe I have the problem. Maybe there's something in my life I should take a look at. We were talking about that a minute ago. We were talking about praying and asking God to reveal some things in your life that you might need to change. This may be one. Maybe your marriage needs a little attention. And if you get on that, and if you get working on that to get that right, then maybe you can get that roadblock removed so that God will hear your prayers again. Roadblock number six, and our last one, is stinginess in giving. This one you're all going to love. Stinginess in giving. There's a direct correlation in our scripture, in the scripture, uh, between the power of prayer and the generosity of our hearts. Proverbs chapter 21, verse 13 says, Whoso stoppeth his ears at the cry of the poor, he also shall cry himself, but shall not be heard. I want you to think about that. When there's people in need... When you, you, know, you know, there's people in need and charities and things that you can give you. Here's someone begging for something or a sign on the street, someone asking for money. What do you do? What kind of thoughts go in your mind? Do you, do you shut your ears to the cries of the poor? Because God said if you do, he's going to shut his ears toward you. I even know, I know churches with godly preachers that I respect who will not give any kind of financial support to an orphanage, who will not do any kind of thing with a food pantry, who will not give any kind of thing like, you know, clothing or stuff that they give out, who won't do anything like that. And they can throw all their money to missions and going, sending to missions and sending to all kinds of places. But you won't just freely give to people who are in need. God's not going to hear the prayers of that church. He says that he will stop it. He won't. He shall cry himself, but shall not be heard. This thing is too full for you. Number one is simply giving to those in need. Charity, alms for the poor. Giving to people who need. That's pretty simple. We know what that means. Number two is providing spiritually for their needs through the giving, financial giving. Well, how does that happen? Well, how do people get their spiritual needs met? How do you get your spiritual needs met? How do you do it? You come to church, right? Come to church, okay. All right. Um, missionaries. Missionaries go around the world and take the gospel to places, right? Missionaries do that. How are they supported? Where does that come from? From tithe. From your giving to the church. From tithe. My grandparents had a saying. They said that uh, it's not out of the Bible, but it, it sounds like it could ring true. That if you don't tithe your income to the church, he'll take it out of you some other way. You Maybe you didn't give to the church that week, but then your car breaks down. And they would say, well, God got it out of me one way or another. Now, we, we here, we don't like to hear that. I was talking with Patty again, the person I mentioned earlier. 
talking about why God doesn't hear her prayers. So we're just talking about some things. I'm not sure if she brought it up or if I brought it up, but tithe was this thing that came into, into question. And, and she's like, well, you know, I, I give when I can. It's okay. Um, well, the Bible teaches that 10% of your income goes to the church. That's the tithe. And she's like, oh, no, no, I, I don't do that. You know, I talked to my preacher at the liberal church down south, and he said, you know, th there's nothing in the New Testament that says I need to tithe to the church. You know, and I just, we're supposed to freely give, and you, you don't want to give anything above your means that's going to take out of your stuff, but you, you, and God wants you to give happily. Just give what you want. And she mentions the widow's might. Now, you know that story about the old, the widow who put a, her might, which is basically a couple of pennies or something and she puts her her her, her little uh, coin there into the offering and Jesus hears it and he says he rebukes everybody else and he says verily I say unto you uh, this woman hath given uh, more than all the rest because they gave of abundance of their riches but she as poor as she is gave in all the living that she had and she's like well she just gave a little bit and I give what I can well here's a little bit of a difference Patty see when she gave in all the living that she had that's not 10% of her income, that's 100% of her income. That is her money for her food, her sustenance, or any bills that she has. She put it all in. And she's living on faith alone. And I highly doubt any of you listening to me have ever done that in life. So don't you even begin to use that as an example. Malachi 3.8 says this, Will a man rob God? Will he? Let's find out. Yet ye have robbed me. But you say, wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. In tithes and offerings. What is the tithe? Well, it's found in Leviticus chapter 27, verses 30 through 32. Basically, it's one-tenth of your provision, your first fruits. And, and, and goes on. He uses the illustration in these about a farmer and a cattle rancher, pretty much. Back then, that's pretty much all they had. So that's what you did. You either had meat or you had plants and you sold them. And that's how you made your, your, your living. That's what you did. Today, we have a whole lot, a lot of other ways that we make our living. All right. I work part-time as a picture framer for Michaels. Well, back in those days, they didn't have any pictures they needed to frame. Okay, so there, there, you know, there's just you know things that we have that they didn't have. But if you're a farmer, he says in those passages, and this is what Patty said, she's like, oh, those passages only refer to if you have farming or cows. Okay, I guess so only the farmers or the cattle ranchers support the church and no one else has to, just give what you can. All right, one-tenth of your provision. The farmer is to give one-tenth of all the produce from his land or the sale of that produce and if you have cattle you give one tenth of all your cattle or the sale of that cattle and that goes to the church and, and you might say like patty well i can't afford to give a tenth of my income i mean i have bills to pay i am stretched beyond my limits i give everything to everybody else i'm sorry then don't expect god to hear your prayers this is a hard one to swallow. And this is not a sermon on tithe. Believe me, I can preach on tithe. You know, the Mormon church, it is a requirement that you give 10% of your income to the church. It's a requirement. It's not a requirement from us. It's what God wants you to do. But it's a requirement for the Mormons. So the Mormons... Just a little things about them. The Mormons are the second richest church in the world behind the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church, they go centuries back. They have all their beautiful buildings and stuff and all things go on. There's a lot of money in that. The Mormons are the second richest behind the Catholic Church, much newer. A lot younger than the Catholic Church. But if you compare that, the Mormons are also, the, the amount of giving that they take for the amount of numbers that they have, their giving, percentage-wise, is far greater than anybody else. Did you know also that the fastest growing religion in the world is the Mormon faith? Why do they do that? Well, they have money to send missionaries everywhere. They have the money to do it because the people give. Can you imagine what that could do for the church if the people in the church gave? I mean, we wouldn't have to struggle sending 25 bucks to a missionary. We can support churches going up and getting people out and giving them vehicles to be able to go places to spread the gospel and share this. All of that comes from giving. And, and I'm sorry, it says the tithes and offerings... 
The tithe, basically, you know, he says, how have you robbed me? You've robbed me in your tithe. Basically, the tithe doesn't belong to you. People say, all the church wants is my money. It's not your money. It never was yours. It's God's money. The tithe is your rent that you pay to God for the privilege to exist. You are alive on earth. He gives you breath. He takes care of your needs. You know, and people never have financial problems because they don't make enough money. They have financial problems because they live above their means. And that's your problem. You're materialistic. You're greedy. You're selfish. You want these things. You want this stuff. This new car. That new house. This new furniture. You want all that stuff. And you don't have enough money to tie it to God because of what you spend it on in your bills. And then you wonder why God doesn't hear your prayers. I give you a quick illustration about me years ago, uh, back uh, years, years and years ago. My family, we, you know, I was the only one working. I made fourteen dollars an hour. I supported a family of five, recently married, but three kids. Made fourteen dollars an hour. My wife did not work; she was unemployed. She stayed home with the kids, and I worked. We gave twenty-five percent of our income to the church, off of fourteen bucks an hour. 10% was the tithe. That goes right to the general offering. It doesn't go to any kind of charities you want. Notice he says the tithes and the offerings. There's a difference. You see, when, when you got all the New Testament verses, it starts talking about giving cheerfully and stuff like that. And give abundantly and you may receive abundantly. That's talking about your offerings. That's what you do out of the goodness of your heart that's above and beyond what's required. The tithes required. Never belong to you in the first place. That belongs to God. That's Bible. And people say, well, this is not mentioned in the New Testament. Well, show me in the New Testament where it says we don't have to do tithe anymore. It doesn't say that either. But it does give some verses. 2 Corinthians 9, 7 says to give cheerfully. 1 Corinthians 16, verse 2 says that they gave as God hath prospered them in the church. And, and so, you know, 1 Corinthians, New Testament, they're giving as God hath prospered them. That is a percentage based off of what their income was. That's the tithe. They're giving it. 2 Corinthians 9, 6. Whatsoever man's, you know, talking about sowing and reaping. It's a, it's, a, it's a farming analogy. Basically, if you sow sparingly, you're going to reap sparingly. If you sow abundantly, you're going to reap abundantly. That basically means if I stick 15 seeds in the ground, I'm going to get 15 plants. And if I stick 1,500 seeds in the ground, I'm going to get 1,500 plants. Which one do you think is going to give me more profit? 1,500. Okay, so you sow sparingly, you're not going to get much back. Give a little bit, but if you give a lot, you're going to give a lot. So I gave 25% of my income. I'm not doing this to pat myself on the back. Just as an illustration, we gave the tithe to the church, general offering, 10%. I gave an additional 10% to missions. We wrote on that check, missions. This isn't for fund the general fund. This is strictly for the missionaries. And then on our own, we had an evangelist named uh, Brother Jack Parchman, did tent revivals that we supported. And we also supported a television evangelist, Dr. Jack Van Impey. And I sent 2.5% uh, you know, of our income to one and 2.5% of our income to the other. And I sent those out. And you know what? Our checkbook never balanced. We couldn't figure out how we ever paid bills. We had more bills than we had income. For some reason, there was never a shortage of money. I never bounced a check. We never ran short on food. We always had it. God always provided for our needs. There was a time when a guy just gave us a check for $2,000 just because he felt that the Lord led him to do it. All right, You give when you are giving in faith and putting God first. He takes care of you. Just imagine what we could do if we had that kind of faith as a church. It could be something. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7 says, God loveth a cheerful giver. He doesn't like a tightwad. God doesn't, you know, God hates it when people say, all the church wants is my money. You know, and God doesn't like your stinginess. And you know what? You don't have to do it. You don't have to tithe. It's not... You know, it's not like the Mormon church. You're not required to do it or you can't be a member. But don't be surprised when your prayers aren't answered. And so six roadblocks. Just to recap, we had prayerlessness. You have not because you ask not. 
asking for the wrong motives or asking selfishly, sin in your life or in your heart, an unforgiving spirit, disunity in your marriage, and stinginess in your giving. We have you know, There's roadblocks in our lives that keep our prayers from being answered. And so last thing, my last illustration I'm going to give in my close, you know, there would be some times that I might like some prayers to be answered and God to be able to hear my prayer. So I'm going to close with this story. This is a testimony that I heard in person, missionary who has gone home to be with the Lord now, Brother Nick Bickish. He was a missionary up in Alaska. This guy, I met him several times. You know, he had a great testimony. He was a big guy. I mean, this guy would go out reaching Eskimos in Alaska. There was one time he was just hiking through the wilderness trying to reach an Eskimo village and a grizzly bear attacked him. And all he had to defend himself was a Bowie knife. And he defended himself and fought off that grizzly bear with a Bowie knife. I mean, this guy was a man's man. I mean, and he had a heart for God and serving God. So there's this one time he wanted to get to this very remote village and the only access to it with igloos and stuff, only access to it was um, by plane or helicopter. And so he chartered a plane to go up there for the day so he could go around to this village and, and visit these Eskimos and share the gospel of Jesus Christ to them. And so he did that and they, and they uh, went up and they, um, they, they shared the gospel and they left around. They're on their way back and they're flying. It's now nighttime or getting dark. It's about twilight. You can still see, but it, it's, it's almost dark. You can see a little bit. He's just walking around the cabin. Maybe he took a drink of his glass of water like I'm doing now. He's looking up ahead at the windshield, and he sees there's a mountain coming in the distance. And they're getting a little close to it. He's like, wow, I'm surprised the pilot isn't flying a little bit higher. That mountain's right there. And, uh, you know, he's just kind of watching. They're, they're getting closer and closer and closer to that mountain and starting to get a little bit nervous. So he goes up, and, and he just he goes up, and he looks at the pilot. The pilot is sitting there holding on to the controls. His hands are shaking like this, and his face is as white as a ghost. And he says to him, he looks up and he says, the, the, the wings are frozen, the flaps are frozen. I can't move the plane. We're going to crash. There's nothing I can do. And this is a true story. Brother Bickish went back and he, and he says to the guy, he's like, well, I'm going to go pray. And he went and he laid down on his face in the aisle in that plane. And he said these words. I will never forget these words as long as I live. These exact words. He said, Oh Lord, it would be nothing at all for thee to help. And that's it. He got up. He walked back up to the cockpit. They're getting pretty close. And they were just looking around. And then they noticed something moving. It was the temperature gauge outside. It was about 40 degrees below zero. That temperature gauge starts moving and they're looking at rise and it comes from 40, 30 below zero, 20 below zero, 10 below zero, zero, 10, 20, 30, 40. 50 degrees outside. All of a sudden, huge sheet of ice blows off of the left wing. <laughs> huge sheet of ice falls off. The pilot almost loses control as the plane jerks. They look down. The temperature gauge is still rising. 60. 70. All of a sudden, the, the wing on the right. <laughs> huge chunk of ice flies up. The pilot grabs those controls and pulls back as hard as he can. The plane's jerking. They're trying to get up. Their, their, their wheels are just missing the treetops on the top of this mountain as they fly up over top of the mountain and come down the other side. You know, and, and, and uh, they got down there. That pilot was not a saved man. But when they landed that plane, he talked to, to that missionary for a good half hour to an hour that night about God. And he witnessed to God about him. He didn't get saved but you know what he had a heart that was open to it and listened to it because of a miracle now they had in the news they said that this is what they said happened this out of nowhere some freak um wind gust came down from down in the hawaiian islands really quickly and went up to to alaska and caused the temperature to rise like uh what, what was that uh seven <laughs> so like 120 you know something degrees in in just a few seconds out of nowhere and they said that that just some free gale blew up and do that but that missionary prayed you know what he came unto god he was serious it didn't take a lot of words he humbled himself he prayed specifically 
basically, God save us. He meant it. It didn't take a lot. But his heart was something that was right with God so that there was no roadblocks. That prayer, God got the glory from that miracle. That missionary, when he was done with that, the only thing he could think of is, maybe there is a God. And maybe this guy knows who he is. And maybe I should talk to him about it. And when you come to God praying those things, that's a true story. Then miracles do happen. They didn't stop in the Old Testament, the New Testament. They didn't stop with the New Testament church. They still happen today. But we can't access that power because of of our selfish desires. We don't pray right. We don't pray effectively. We d and then when we do pray, we have all these things in our lives that hinder prayers. Friends, come on. Get your prayer life. You want to get, see the power of God? You need His, His power in your miraculous situation? Then let's get the roadblocks out of our lives so that our prayers can be heard. Everybody's head bowed and your eyes closed. No one looking around. First off, I'm just going to ask right off the bat, like this, like this, uh, that uh, man, that pilot, who needed to know what on earth had just happened with that stuff going on with that missionary. Just by an outstretched hand testimony. Is there anyone here in here would say, I know Jesus Christ is my Savior. If I died tonight, I know that I would go to heaven. Just raise your hand if you know that's you. God bless you. I see those hands. God bless you. God bless you. I see some hands, but I know that not everyone's hand is raised. And so that tells me something. That tells me that you're honest. You can put your hands down. Would there be anyone who would say, you know what? I have some problems, some roadblocks in my life. And I don't pray in such a way that God's going to answer my prayers, but I'd like to. Brother Spencer, will you pray for me? I'd like to know that God will answer my prayers. Will you help me to be, you know, pray for me that God will help me get those roadblocks out of my life? Would any of you with the outstretched hands like to say that? I have some roadblocks, some problems in my prayer life, and I need some help to get those out. Would anyone say that? God bless you. Maybe those of you listening out there online, maybe you would see these things too. And maybe you need some, some effect of some power uh, in your prayer life, but your prayers aren't hindered and, and you would like to get that. Then, then today can be, today, listen, today is your, is your time of decision and your day of reckoning. You can get that taken care of. You can get that squared away. Friends, those of you listening online, if anyone would like to get saved and you say, Brother Spencer, I would like to get some power and prayer in my life. But first thing, I just want to know that I'm saved. And you and you have a repentant heart and you would like to come and see and, and get to know Jesus Christ and accept him as your savior. You can today pray this prayer after me. Lord Jesus, I am a sinner, but I know that you came into this world and died on Calvary's cross to forgive my sins. I now repent of my sins and place my faith and trust in you. Please come into my heart and forgive me of my sins. Please wash me clean of my sins. Please forgive me of my sins. Please, Lord, I I repent of my sins. Save me. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. And uh, now, those of you out there, I'll pray for you now. If you need power in your prayer life, Lord God, I just pray that you would help those people who, who see that they have some problems in their prayer life and how they come to you and approach you in our, in our sermon from part one. But also, Lord, how, um, how, how they might need some help to get those kinks out of their hoses. Please, Lord, help them to be able to have the strength to break those ties, to break those things that are holding them back so that they can come into a closer relationship with you, Lord. Please be with them in that. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Friend, I thank you for being here. Friend, if, if you made that decision to trust Jesus Christ with your heart, we'd love to hear about it. Would you get a hold of us and contact us on our website, um, swordandtrialrevivalfellowship.com. Just come onto the contact page. We'd love to hear from you. And if you're looking for a church to join, perhaps you're in a remote area like those Eskimos, but maybe you have internet. And perhaps you have no way of being able to get here in person for our services. Well, we would love to have you join us in our fellowship online. You can check us out online and find out ways to do that. But, you know, friend, my, my ultimate goal, everything that I want, I, I want to see you grow in your relationship with God. I want to see you get saved if you're not. I want to see your prayers be heard. We need some revival in our country. We need some revival desperately. And we need some Christians who have a relationship, a good relationship, a praying relationship with God that they can come to God and their prayers be not hindered. I hope that this, this sermon today would help you to have that kind of relationship. Thank you so much for joining us today at the Sword and Trial for Revival Fellowship. May God be with you as you go on your way. Take care. It was a blessing to have you with us today.